Bishop Carter gave a wonderful message, and I noticed that throughout his message and throughout all the announcements, he had several bottles of water, and he was drinking them all through. And I'm like, I could do that too, because you know, your mouth gets dry up here, and so I have this because that tends to happen, um, and I won't hesitate to use it. Thank you for having grace with me. Um, growing up, I thought Christmas was the big celebration of the year. I really thought that that was what church was all about, because all my friends who attended church, um, that seemed to be the big, the big thing to them. And um, I didn't go to church, and I really didn't. I knew it was the birth of Jesus, but that was really all I knew. I really didn't know much else. But when I became a Christian in my early 30s, I really started to get a bigger picture. Um, I think some of you have heard me speak about my encounter with Christ. Um, we were invited to this church um, by my principal, who became a friend, um, and he was inviting us persistently, but very gently. Longtime member Charles Hill. And um, I know he's shining down and looking at me right now. Um, he and Larry and Jesus are all going, See, we knew, we knew she could do it. I didn't know, but they knew. Um, but he invited us many times, and when we came to church that day, I walked into this sanctuary and I felt something. And I met Jesus right there in the middle of the aisle. And it was, he filled a hole in my heart that I didn't even know I had. And it was amazing. It was amazing. Um, the Bible study and Sunday school lessons and sermons. Um, I really started to see what being a Christian is all about. What it really means to be a believer, a follower of Christ. And I really began to understand that Easter was really the big deal. That was the most important day to us as believers and really to the whole world. Of course, Christmas is important. It's when Jesus was born and it kind of started that ministry. But Easter is all about Jesus dying on the cross for us, for our sins. It's what our beliefs, it's the foundation of our faith. It's our identity as a Christian. But what about today? Pentecost. What really is Pentecost? We know that it's called the beginning of the church, kind of the church's birthday. But what does that really mean? And that's the church with capital C, the global church. But what does it really mean? Well, the word Pentecost comes from the Greek word 50. I'm not going to tell you what the Greek word is because it's too hard to pronounce, but you know that it stands for 50. And what that is, is the 50th day after Passover. Not after Easter, but after Passover. The Feast of Pentecost originated as an offering of first fruits, that first fruit of the harvest. It was decreed by God to Moses as he received the law on Mount Sinai. Fifty days after Passover, or seven weeks, is Pentecost Day. And it would be set aside as a time to bring their offerings to Jerusalem. In the Old Testament, this day had several names. It was also called Shabbat, which it is still today called Shabbat. Feast of Pentecost, or Festival of Weeks, meaning the seven weeks, because it started the day after Passover. It was really a, a festival for expressing their thankfulness for all that God had, and the Lord had done them. So this was one of the three festivals where all Jewish males probably their families, were called to Jerusalem from everywhere, from all over the world, all over the land. People of different tri tribes, people that spoke different languages. So it was like an international multitude gathering. It had everybody. They were from Egypt, from Rome, from Judea, and all the other places in the land. And they were gathered together in Jerusalem for Pentecost. But this year, Pentecost was going to be different. Very, very different. So let's go back to Good Friday and Easter. Jesus was betrayed on Thursday, and on Friday he was beaten and nailed to the cross. And he died in the afternoon of Friday. And his body was prepared and laid in a borrowed tomb with a huge stone in front of it. 
and guards were placed there to make sure that nobody messed with Jesus. Jesus' followers were absolutely devastated. They were filled with despair. They were filled with fear. They had believed that Jesus was the promised Messiah, that, that he was the one, and now their hopes were shattered, completely shattered. They had already forgotten Jesus' promise that he would return from the grave. It was probably pretty far-fetched. I mean, they'd never experienced that. So I can imagine that they just kind of let that go and forgot about it in their despair. And as we know, early on the third day, Sunday, it was discovered that the tomb was empty. Jesus had said he would come back, and he did. Jesus was resurrected in a glorified body. So when Jesus appeared to the disciples after the resurrection, their lives were changed. The greatest miracle of our history had just taken place. Jesus Christ was alive. Jesus prayed with them, he spent time with them, he spoke with them, he broke bread with them, and he stayed with them for 40 years. 40 days. 40 days, I know. 40 days. Did you know that? Did you realize that he stayed here on earth with his disciples for 40 days? I probably have heard that. I mean, I've heard since becoming a Christian probably about maybe almost 40 Pentecost Sunday messages. And I'm sure that that detail was shared. <coughs> and I'm sure that I heard the entire Pentecost story probably 40 times. But it didn't sink into my brain until I started preparing this message. And I realized, 40 days? Well, why did he stay around for 40 days? Because he wanted to prove without a doubt to those disciples and to the people that he was truly alive, that God had brought him back from the dead. The all-powerful God had brought him back. He spoke to, Jesus spoke to a lot of people, not just the disciples. He went out and spoke to everybody. And it said in, I think it's in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, that Jesus appeared to more than 500 people at one time. People were hearing him and seeing this resurrected Jesus. He also stayed on earth so that he could tell the disciples how to continue the ministry. He was telling them and reminding them of the things that he had done while he was here on earth. And he also told his disciples that he was going to be leave again, but that his Father, God, would send an advocate to be in his place, someone that would continue to walk with them and would always be with them and would never leave them. And that was the Holy Spirit. So Jesus left. And again, the disciples were like, what's going to happen? And what's going to happen? When is it going to happen? What are we going to do? They were filled with despair all over again. And ten days passed after Jesus left. They were gathered in a home, one of the homes. And the book of Acts tells it this way. We were all in this home with other people too. And suddenly a powerful rushing wind filled the house. Tongues of fire came down. Through the roof, tongues of fire came down and went on each of the disciples' heads. Just a little flame over the tops of their heads. We probably have a graphic, I think, of this. Because it's hard to imagine, but they had fire on top of their heads. They felt themselves filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what that was. They began to speak, and they all began to speak in different languages, in different tongues. The people who had come to Jerusalem for Pentecost, or food for the Festival of Weeks, for the Festival of Harvest, they saw this, and they heard the disciples, the apostles, speaking in different languages, and they thought that the men were drunk, because that's what it sounded like. So the Apostle Peter stood and addressed the gathered crowd, and he told them they weren't drunk. They had been empowered by the Holy Spirit, and that God was fulfilling the promise in the Old Testament from the book of Joel, the prophet Joel, where he said the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all people. 
Peter preached boldly about Jesus Christ and about God's plan for salvation. He spoke of the wonderful acts of God who raised Jesus from the dead. The apostles were all speaking the good news, but they were speaking them in different languages. And the people that gathered were astounded because each of them could hear what the apostles were saying in their own language. Peter and the others told the pilgrims the message of repentance, of forgiveness for their sins. And those were some of the same people who had cheered the crucifixion of Jesus. And they were like, how can this be for us? How could we be forgiven for such a horrible, horrible, taking part in such, such a horrible act? And Peter said, God can forgive because Jesus Christ died. And they accepted that message of hope and that message of repentance. And that day, 3,000 of them accepted the message of Jesus Christ. They were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, of the Father and the Holy Spirit. And they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those 3,000 souls added to the church that day and they hailed from all corners of the world. When they left Jerusalem and went back to their homes, they took that message with them, back to their communities, back to their families. Just as we are each called to carry that message of good news out into the world here, they carried that message wherever they went, to the ends of the earth. And that's why we claim Pentecost as the birth of the Christian church. The Jewish people celebrated a joyous harvest on Shabbat. We, as the universal church, celebrate a harvest of souls on Pentecost. So back in 1981, when I was a new believer, I was a baby Christian. I was a baby. And I grew up right here at this church. I'm still growing up. I don't think we're ever done. I'm not done. Obvious, God's not done with me. Um, but we all are still growing, or we should be still growing. Some of you have been a big part of my growing up. You taught me in Sunday school and Bible studies. You mentored me. You've listened to my teachings. You've listened to my sermons as I've given you messages as a lay person. You shared your love and your strength with me when I suffered the pain of loss. You have encouraged me and cheered me on as I've taken this step towards licensed local pastor. This path was challenging, and there was a lot of hard work, and the work is far from being over. I have 20 more courses to take over the next five years, um, two or three a year is what they want. And it's going to take um, a lot more encouragement and a lot more cheering on. And so I love and appreciate every one of my cheerleaders in this congregation. And that's all of you, all of you. I am so blessed to be surrounded by this enormous cloud of witnesses, these, these believers who believe in Jesus and they believe in me too, that I can do this. So yesterday, as Gary said, I was officially licensed by the bishop. And so this day begins a new role for me. I'm still just Jeannie. I'm still who I am. That's never going to change because I don't know how not to be. I don't know how to be fake. And I don't know how to not be Jeannie. But I have a new hat. And I have a new chair to sit in. And obviously I have robes to wear. Um, I have new responsibilities. And it's going to be a little bit of an adjustment period. Um, I don't know if you read David's keynote yesterday, but we have talked many times this week, and we've talked about how it kind of shifts from being a layperson and just one of the crowds, and now I'm up here. Um, so it changes, but it, some things are not going to change. And we talked about how, and I, I said, well, you know, it's kind of like when we were all teachers, and then all of a sudden my friend became a principal. And for a while, she was my principal. 
and we were still friends, but she was set apart, you know, especially at school, especially when we were doing our, our education business. But outside, she was still just, just my friend. But I've experienced that with a lot of different friends who have gone on into administration, and um, it's an adjustment, but it's, it's all good. It's all good. I'm actually, um, I have an office, it's always open to you all, and I'm really thankful that the bishop appointed me here to St. John's to work alongside David, to continue to shepherd you with David. That's, that's a huge blessing for me. God put this call in my heart, but he calls each one of us. And he calls us to step out of our comfort zone, and trust me, I am stepping way out of my comfort zone. Um, this is, but he has called me to do that since 2003. And finally I said yes, finally I listened and said, okay, I will go back to school and I will do what you said in front of me. But he asks each one of us to step out, maybe not go back to school, maybe not become a pastor, but become a leader, to become a servant for him, to do things with Jesus in mind, to do things where how can I spread this wonderful message that I have, that I've been given from, from Christ, and how can I share that with the people that I encounter, the people that I know in my own family, the people that I know in my workplace, or my the places that I go to relax and enjoy, or just standing in the line at Walmart. How can I share a little bit of the story of Jesus and forgiveness and eternal life? Because we're supposed to do that wherever we go. And we don't go alone. We go with the power of the Holy Spirit. And there have been times when I have said, no way, I'm not going to talk to that person that I know I'm being nudged to talk to. And I'm like, I don't have any words, but I don't want to mess this up. Or I don't have time. And then I say, okay, give me the words, please, God. Send the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to open my mouth, and I want you to speak. And you know what? It happens. You never really say the wrong thing when you ask God to help you. Oh, the good things, and sometimes I don't even remember what I've said, but the good things come out. Because I can see down the road results of that. And sometimes we never see. Sometimes we're blessed to be able to see so he calls us to do that, to step out of that comfort zone. You might have noticed that there's more color in here. I, I love that, that some of you wore red. I have red over here. Um, there's that banner. There's the flames of the, over their heads. Instead of a light bulb that went off over my head when I was preparing this message, I kind of like to think it was the flame of the Holy Spirit that empowered me to go forward more and more. Um, that color red has great meaning because it reminds us of the Holy Spirit. That's the color that we associate with the Holy Spirit. Is there a flame over your head? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Sometimes life in the busyness of our days can often dampen our flame. Difficult circumstances and pain and loss they try to snuff it out. Sometimes we need to ask God to rekindle that flame. We need to ask Him anew. He knows what's in our hearts. He can read us. He knows before we ever think it, what we're going to think, what we're going to say. But He wants us to say it out loud to Him. It's just like our children. When we say, I love you, we, they need to hear that. And we need to hear our children and our loved ones say, I love you. Even though we know they love us, we need to hear those words. God loves us, and we love him, and sometimes he just needs to hear the words out loud. I love you. Please come into my heart. Give me strength. He wants to hear that. As we sing the next song, our song of response, the altar is open. The altar of Christ is always open. 
So come and receive the fire of the Holy Spirit. Rekindle that flame in your heart. You can do this from your seat because God will meet you wherever you are. But sometimes, sometimes it's good just to come to the altar of Christ and one-on-one -on -one talk with him. And if you come and you want prayer with someone, just put your hand like right here on your shoulder. And if we see your hand on your shoulder, someone will come and pray with you. So you can pray by yourself. Just don't put your hand up there. That's an invitation to someone to come and pray. Come. Invite the Holy Spirit into your heart anew. Amen.